You don't have to raise your hand, but you can look at the screen here and you can think to yourself whether or not any of these pictures reflect the way that you use or have used your technology or your digital devices in your life. Maybe you have woken up in the morning to your phone alarm and spent the first few minutes of your day on your phone. Maybe you've been in a room of people or with people out and about and everybody is kind of in their own individual world on their device. Maybe you've been in the car, stolen a, a glance, shot off a quick message on your phone while driving down the street, found yourself in a solitary moment, gravitating to look at your smartphone to spend time on it. Maybe you have uh, gotten on the computer to do something, right? And 60 minutes later, 90 minutes later, you're still on it. You're not even sure what you got on to do in the first place. Maybe you've sat down to watch a show, the news, a game, looked up, it's past midnight, TV's still on. Maybe you have struggled to go to sleep at night, rolled over and grabbed your phone, a few more checks on Facebook before going to sleep. All of this reflects the way I've used digital devices in my life, and I'm not even really now to say that this is good, bad, or indifferent, but the point I want to illustrate as we begin tonight and this weekend is that I think one of the things that so often characterizes the way that we use our digital devices and our technology in our lives is thoughtlessness, mindlessness, or maybe we would say something more like automation, right? That we don't think so much about the way that we use these devices because they have become so ubiquitous. Digital technology, devices, screens are just so much a part of our life that maybe like sitting, standing, walking, eating, we don't think really much about how we're interacting with these things or what we are doing with them. We use it simply without thinking. But the fact that we're all here in this building tonight to talk about these things and for this weekend in particular obviously is evidence that we want to think about these things, that there is a need, there is a, a, a value in thinking about these things and thinking about the technology that we use on a daily basis, to be thoughtful about it, to be intentional about it. And for that, you as a congregation, and I think you as an individual, if you're here tonight, you're to be commended for your interest in that. So let's start thinking about it tonight. And uh, this lesson in particular is kind of the beginning. How would you even begin as a Christian, someone using the Bible as uh, your source of truth, of knowledge, and of wisdom? How do you even go about starting to think about the technology that we use? Where does that begin? Well, tonight we're going to begin with the beginning. And I'd ask you to take your Bible out. Uh, I hope that you can see it in front of you. Uh, personal opinion would be great if that's a paper Bible that you can turn the pages of, uh, and turn it to the book of Genesis, to the opening chapters of the Bible story, and we'll be overviewing a lot of what's going on here, reading some verses. And in particular, what we want to do tonight in this first lesson is look at some of these opening stories of the Bible and talk about how it is that we should view technology. And we're going to look at the Garden of Eden. And we're going to paint a picture of technology's place in the world that God intended for man to inhabit. And then we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel, the city of Babylon, and how technology was used there. And paint these two distinct contrasting pictures and then ask ourselves, which of those two has guided or has, has dominated the way that we ourselves look at technology in our world? So let's look at the book of Genesis starting in the first chapter, and we'll just look at our Bibles here for the next few minutes. In Genesis chapter 1, the work of God in creation is really bringing order out of chaos. The first three days, he separates uh, the realms of, of, of the world, light and dark, waters above, waters beneath, sea and dry land. And then on days 4, 5, and 6, he fills the world with life. And the result of all of that is that it is good, the text says over and over again. But then on day six, God crowns his creation with mankind, man and woman. Genesis 1, 26, read with me. It says that God said, let us make man in our image, 
according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God makes man and woman in his image. And Scott's going to talk more about that in the next lesson. But among other things, we would say that that means that God makes man different than the rest of creation. Man and woman have faculties, right? Emotional, spiritual, rational, intellectual capabilities that set them apart from the rest of creation. And then with that difference, man is charged by God here in Genesis 1 to rule. It's, it's language of, of kings and queens to rule over creation, to subdue the earth, to have dominion. Humans are made to rule as benevolent kings under the authority, of course, of God, their creator. We come to chapter 2 of Genesis, we see a more detailed account of creation and man's role in it. Look at chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 5. It says that, Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Verse 7, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden towards the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This text is interesting here because it indicates that the plants of the ground had not yet grown up or sprouted. That may mean they hadn't flourished yet. Because two things, there hadn't been rain sent yet and because there was no man to cultivate the ground. So without man there to cultivate the ground, there wouldn't be this flourishing of the plants. And so God makes man and puts him in the garden, which is in Eden, which is a place in the earth, suggesting that perhaps that was supposed to expand. Remember chapter 1, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. But man's task is is stated explicitly later on in, in Genesis 2 in verse 15. Notice the language here. Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Two things that man is created and intended to do here, two words that will be important this weekend. One, man is to cultivate the ground. That's a word that can mean work or serve We're going to call that man's productive purpose. He's to cultivate the garden, to bring forth fruit. He's also supposed to keep uh, or to guard or to protect. We'll call that a protective purpose. So to cultivate, productive purpose, and to keep the garden, to protect it, to guard it. Okay, let me stop here and ask you some questions. We've talked about man and uh, human's role in creation as God intended. So if we think about what that would have looked like if it played out, imagine the world as God created it, man and woman in the garden, and that continuing on, right, even, you know, through generations. What would it have looked like for humans to fulfill their God-given role? What would it have looked like for humans to multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over fish and birds and beasts? What would it have looked like For humans to cultivate and even expand a garden and receive every plant and fruit as food to protect that garden from potential threats or dangers. Let me ask you this. Do we think God intended for man to use his intellectual and rational capabilities in fulfilling that purpose that he was given? Do we think that doing all these things that God intended would have required man to invent, to create, to build? I think so. 
And I think from the principles of Genesis 1 and 2, we could say this about the Eden view of technology. We believe that God made man, made humans in his image to rule, specifically to cultivate and to protect, to fill the earth with God's glory. And the man was made in God's image and has an intellect and has an ingenuity that he's been blessed with by God. And so I think we can say by implication then that God intended for man to build, to create, to use technology even in a way that would serve creation and fill the earth with God's glory. That's the Eden view of man's purpose and how technology would fit into that. But the question is, how did that go? How did it work out for the humans when you read past Genesis 2? Well, the short answer is not very good, right? A little bit longer answer would mean surveying Genesis 3 to 11. Of course, in Genesis chapter 3, the humans rebel against God. And it's not just simple disobedience, eating that fruit, but it is rebelling. It is defining good for themselves to say this thing that God has restricted, that is good. It is the humans reaching out to control their own destiny, to be the masters of their own fate as opposed to submitting to God's authority. And of course, the consequences of that are catastrophic. They are removed from God's presence. They are removed from the garden. And they're cast out into a harsh and broken world. And there's three consequences in particular in Genesis chapter 3 as God explains to Adam and Eve what has happened now that they have sinned against him. One of those is the breaking down of human relationships Immediately after the sin, there is a brokenness in human relationships. There is blame, there is distrust, there is pain between the humans. The second thing is there is now brokenness in creation. The thorns and the thistles, remember that Adam was going to have to fight. Now the world is full of toil and difficulty. And then, of course, the third thing is the consequence of death. The humans are cut off from the tree of life, and now they will return to the dust from which they were created all humans will die. And so they go out of Eden into this broken world. But notice in Genesis 3, 23, it says that God sent them out of the garden to work the ground, which tells us that although now the world is broken by sin, humans now retain, they still retain their purpose for which God created them. So all that stuff we learned in Genesis 1 and 2 about what man was made for, that hasn't changed. But now they are to do so in a world that is broken, a world that's full of toil and difficulty. But the rebellion of humanity, of course, continues. Cain kills his brother in chapter 4. Cain is told to be a wanderer because of his sin, and yet he settles and builds a city, kind of poking God in the eye in Genesis 4, 12 to 17. Cain's descendants in the rest of chapter 4 continue their rebellion, and even, we learn in Genesis 4, develop kind of these first forms of technology that we read about in the Bible. Musical instruments in verse 21, animal husbandry in verse 20, metallurgy in verse 22. And we could ask, to what purpose did Cain's descendants put this newfound technology? And of course, we're not told. But the picture of Genesis 4 I think is clearly a picture of humanity rushing into more and more rebellion and wickedness and violence, so much so that by chapter 6, God decides to purge the earth, right? To start over with the flood, and to save Noah and his family. But even after that, Noah and his sons repeat the cycle of sin, and the sin and rebellion continues and continues until we come then to Genesis chapter 11, and the culmination of that rebellion in the story of the Tower of Babel, which is the other story we want to highlight tonight. So let's look at Genesis chapter 11 and read what happens here at the famous Tower of Babel and then talk about it. Genesis 11 verse 1, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons 
of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. You notice that this this story begins with the development of a new technology. We don't want to miss that. And what an amazing technology it is, right? You imagine with construction, you know, before this, I guess they're using stones that you take out of the earth. Well, that's kind of hard to build with stones that come out in any, you know, shape or the other and try to make those work into building something. But now you can take clay and you can form them into perfect bricks like Legos, right? And you can, you know, make as many as you want and you can put them together with tar. I mean, what a revolution in terms of construction and building. And so what do they do? What do the humans do with this fantastic new technology? Well, they build a city. We've seen this before in the Genesis account. But notice it says that the tower is going to be its top in heaven. Of course, this is ambition. This is pride. This may even be a center of false idolatrous worship. They say, let us make a name for ourselves. Of course, that's ego and pride. But I think more than that, it's we're going to control our own destiny. Make a name for ourselves. And they say, notice, lest we be scattered and fill the earth. They're trying to avoid being scattered and fill the earth. Well, what had God told humans from the beginning that they were supposed to do? Fill the earth. You see, they are resisting. They are rebelling against the very instructions of God. This, of course, is laughable. I mean, God has to come down, right, to see the little city and the little tower that they are building. But it also is to God a serious evil that must be confronted. He says this is just the beginning of what they will do. I think God sees this as the start of a rebellion that will only get worse and worse if humans are left to their own devices, so to speak. And he says that nothing they purpose will be impossible. I used to think that means that, you know, they're going to they're gonna be able to accomplish whatever they want, and so for their pride's sake, I need to, you know, cut them down. It may be that, but I think it's also the fact that what they're purposing is evil. What they're pur- purposing is wickedness. I mean, can you imagine all of humanity crammed into one metropolis of a city? Can you imagine the oppression and the violence that would take place there? And so God says this has to be stopped. So maybe in an act of mercy as much as an act of punishment, God scatters them, fulfilling his purpose for them, of course. And this place becomes the biblical city of Babylon. There's no difference in the Hebrew word there. This is the city of Babylon that's talked about in the rest of the Old Testament. The city of human rebellion. The city that charms the whole earth with her sorcery and seduction. The city that God's people are called to come out of lest they be corrupted by her. So what do we learn from the story of the Tower of Babel about Babylon's view or vision of technology? this is what we see. The view of Babylon is that humans are intelligent and capable, and our potential is unlimited. There is nothing that we can't do. Technological advancement is never ending. There's no need for God because we can do it ourselves. And more than that, we're better off seeking our own purposes. We are going to make a name for ourselves. We can create the world that we want to create and should not be bound by any limitation of, say, religion or tradition or morality. No, in Babylon's view, we can and will discover and invent and build in order to overcome our limitations and create the world that we want for ourselves. This is Babylon's view of technology, and I'm going to tell you tonight, this is precisely the view of modern technology that we are surrounded by. Modern technology is all about this very thing, achieving the impossible, right? And the scary thing about it is that for modern man, it is the possibility of something that becomes the justification for doing it. If we can do it, we should do it. 
this, Tim, is the Jurassic Park quote, right? This is what Ian Malcolm says. He says, you were so busy thinking whether you could do it, you never stopped to ask whether you should do it. But for modern man, if we can do it, we should do it. If we can figure out how to create life in a test tube or use artificial intelligence to write articles and books or travel to other planets or do surgery with robotics from around the world, we should do it. Modern technology is about achieving the impossible. And it's also about creating the world that we desire. We're still trying to make a name for ourselves. And we are still allured by this promise of utopia. We envision heaven on earth in which technological innovation and scientific, scientific discovery will end hunger and cure sickness and bring about world peace. This is our destiny. And with just a few more discoveries and a few more pieces of technology, we'll get there. Solve all the problems with our ingenuity. This is Babel all over again. But really, I think what it's about is resisting the limitations. We are still resisting those limitations that are put on us by God, specifically the consequences of sin. Remember we mentioned earlier the three consequences. One of the consequences of sin is broken relationships. And we think that through technology we can undo that, right? I mean, the internet and social media is designed to bring people back together. The internet is really the modern-day Tower of Babel. And in fact, Google is translating web pages in any language, or you can use Google Translate on a phone between people that don't speak the same language to undo Babel, right? To take away that language barrier through the internet, through social media, we're all connected again. Or think about the toil and the hardship of the broken world, the thorns and the thistles. Well, now we have automation and farming, which takes away so much of the toil. And food is so abundant that the worst thing we have to worry about, at least in our world, is increased egg prices, right? But we've solved, in large part, in the first world countries, you know, the problem of thorns and thistles and toil in, in getting fruit from the earth. And even death, right? Your Apple Watch will tell you if you're about to have a heart attack. And modern medicine eventually will find all the cures, right, for every disease and put off death. And there's even a journalist, James Vlahos, who a few years ago made an artificial intelligence version of his dad, dad bot. He could keep talking to his dad after his dad passed away. I'm trying to envision whether it'd be like talking to my dad after he's passed. I could just, you know, I mean, I already hear his voice all the time in my head. Just keep hearing it for years and years and years. We can conquer death through modern technology. But here's the question I would ask you. How's it going? How's the Babel project working out today? We are more connected than ever before in our world. Are we closer to people? Do we have more fulfilling relationships as a result of that hyper-connection? We have access to more information. A friend of of mine used to say, you know, back before, you know, smartphones were first coming out, it's like if you had a, a, a box in your pocket that could answer any question you ever had, we have access to all this information. Are we smarter people? Are we wiser people as a result? We have comfort and entertainment in abundance, embarrassing amounts of comfort and entertainment compared to anyone who's ever lived on the earth. Are we happier people? And we live longer. We face less pain relatively, more medical options. Are we less afraid of death than our forebears? No, the Babylon project today is just as futile as it was back in Genesis chapter 11 as we continue to kick back against God's authority and continue to resist the limitations that have been placed on us. It all amounts to nothing. Well, we could do all the cultural analysis that you want. We'll do a little bit more of that as the weekend goes on. But as we said, really this weekend is about looking at ourselves, asking ourselves some hard questions So as we close this particular lesson, I want us to think about which of these two visions we've adopted as individuals. How do I think about technology? Have I I bought into Babylon's view? Is that the way I think about my tech and media use? Am I operating under the basic principle, if I can, I will? You know, just because something is possible and available and even affordable 
doesn't mean we should get it or use it or adopt it. Whether it's the newest iPhone or Amazon one-click ordering or smart watches or robot vacuums or smart houses, just because I can doesn't mean I should. Now, I'm not saying you always shouldn't, but it doesn't always mean that we should. But oftentimes, this is the way that we approach tech and media in our own life. If it's available, if it's accessible, then I'll do it. I'll get it. Do I use technology and media simply for my own personal pleasures? Is fulfillment, personal fulfillment, the end goal of of everything that I do? Remember, the goal of the Babel project was to, you know, we do what we want. Is that the way that my tech and media is used in my life? It's simply my habits around you know, gaming and, and, and media consumption and social media. It's just I, I do what I want to do, and my kids, they do what they want to do. Or are we simply trying to make our lives as easy and comfortable as possible, and that's the purpose to which we put technology? Or maybe like Babel, are we just resisting the pain of our limited human experience and using tech and media to escape boredom or sorrow or hard work? And then we might ask whether or not technology and media is leaving us in the end empty and isolated. Because again, like at Babel, this kind of rebellion and resisting the, our limitations is futile. Our attempt to flee brokenness with these things will just lead to more brokenness. Do I really feel better after my media consumption? Do I really feel more fulfilled, more closer to people after my time on social media? Is it filling me up, making me whole? Or is it breaking me down and making me feel empty and isolated? But the beautiful truth is that God already put a plan in place to solve all these problems. I mean, we're talking about the problems that have come upon humans because of sin, the brokenness, the corruption, looking for answers, right? There already is an answer. From the moment the humans rebelled against God, God put his plan into place to solve the problems of human sin And brokenness. There's already a plan to reverse the curse, to restore what humans forfeited in their rebellion. And that, of course, is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus' blood that we are reconciled to God and then truly reconciled to our brothers and sisters in Christ to live in true unity with one another. It's in Jesus that there is redemption for the brokenness of life. There is real peace and joy and contentment and fulfillment. And by the Spirit of God, guess what? We are even conquerors of death. And know that because Jesus rose from the dead, we ourselves will rise from the dead when Jesus returns. God's already solved the problem. And He's done so in Jesus. That's the promise of the gospel. But one of the things that the gospel does is not just that overarching big story of redemption, but in the gospel, we ourselves are redeemed. I want to highlight that word. To redeem something is to make it useful again, is to make it fruitful again, to turn things around. And so even the things that have been a part of our brokenness can be redeemed to serve God, to be fruitful, to contribute to the blessing that God has for us, even technology. I mean, think about those things that the descendants of Cain created, right? Cain's line invented musical instruments. And maybe now the beginning, that was just a self-serving kind of pleasurable thing. But remember, David put those same instruments to use, creating beautiful and moving songs to God in temple worship. Metallurgy was part of that uh, invention of the descendants of Cain, and yet metalworking was put to use for the implements of 
tabernacle worship and temple worship in the Old Testament as well. And ultimately, when you read the last few pages of the Bible, we read about a picture of a new heavens and a new earth that are not just a garden, but a city in which I think God's work and man's work harmoniously give praise to God in perfect beauty and splendor. So to reject the Babylon view is to not reject all of the tools and all of the the technology that the world is putting to its own rebellious purposes. To reject Babylon's view is to adopt the Eden view in which we can use and we can have these things redeemed for God-glorifying and God-honoring purposes. And so we would ask ourselves these kinds of questions. Can I use my device in submission to God? If I believe that God made me to be the a master in creation, then can I be the master of these tools that God has given me instead of the other way around and being mastered by them? And if I believe that God intended for me to use these tools to do the work that he has given me to do, then how can I use my smartphone, my laptop, my TV, my technology to do that very thing? Can I bring my devices into submission to God? Can I use tech and media to produce good fruit? Fruitfulness is still a part of God's vision for his people. Think about the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of righteousness. How can technology and media be used to cultivate fruitfulness in my life, in the life of my family, in the life of other people? And then ultimately, does my use of technology give glory to God? If Babel is about Look who I am. Look what I have done, what I have built for myself. Eden is about filling the earth with God's glory and using technology to do so, to point more and more people to God, to praise Him, to bring Him glory now and forever. Does my use of technology and social media do that? So this is just the beginning of what we will try to accomplish this weekend. These are the kinds of questions that we invite you to ask over the next few days. And I would say that our number one goal in presenting these lessons is for each of us to be self-critical. This is not a kids these days kind of series. This is not a the world out there kind of series. This is for each and every one of us including Scott and myself. I'll begin this weekend by telling on myself. I haven't, told, I haven't confessed this to Scott yet. My son, Asher, is going to turn three in a couple weeks. And uh, this week, for the first time, you know what he said to me? Well, he he was wanting to play with blocks or trains or whatever. You know what he said to me? Put the phone down, Daddy. Put the phone down, Daddy. This is for all of us, ourselves included. The goal is for us to be self-critical. And I know there's a somewhat of an irony in the fact that Scott and I are two young whippersnappers standing up here telling you about wisdom and how to lead the good life. And maybe an even greater irony in the fact that Scott and I, as young as we are, have been raised with the technological silver spoon in our mouths. We understand that. We're just humbly submitting these things and asking for your consideration and asking for your insight. And that would be the second goal. The first goal is to be self-critical, each of us looking at ourselves. The second goal would be to start a conversation, talk about these things. Talk about it with us. Ask us questions. Give us your feedback. But maybe more importantly, talk about this among yourselves. Talk with your families and as a church, talk about these things together. We're not here to give you all the answers because we don't have all the answers. But we simply ask you this weekend to join us as we seek in God's word wisdom And through that, the fruitfulness of life that he created us for. Thank you for your kind attention as we start this weekend.